bow your heads as I ask for the Lord to lead in the promulgation of this message. Gracious Father in heaven, give your people the mind of Christ. In an age where we are being massaged to think one way and to act another, in a world where we are wondering which direction to take in an environment that has presented to us a paradigm shift that finds us at a place of great discomfort. Lord, may we read your word that we may have the mind of Christ. May we understand the unfolding of prophecy. May we see that those things long foretold are coming to pass and the time has come. And so now send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Awaken us and quicken us to the times in which we live that the people of God may understand the times and know what they should do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It was the longest and most meaningless movie ever made. It was an underground movie made in the United Kingdom. The movie was 48 hours long. You heard me correctly. A movie 48 hours long. And the challenge was, who can sit for the entire 48-hour period and endure the longest, most meaningless movie in the world? The movie had no script. It was made up of footage that was too worthless to make an actual movie. It was made of commercials and discarded video footage. People paid, listen carefully, people paid to sit for 48 hours to watch a seemingly endless stream of newsreel and stock footage that had been discarded because it was too worthless to make an actual movie. And once again, the challenge was who can sit for the long period of 48 hours. When you go back in the annals of history, it was undoubtedly the longest film ever made. However, it was not the content of the movie that made it famous. It was its duration, the time of the movie, the length of it. Who would sit for 48 hours and watch a meaningless movie? That's what made it famous. Not its content, but the time. Friends, when we look at what the Bible has told us, when we unfold what the prophets have written, when we listen to the words of Jesus and follow the proclamation of the apostles, it's all about time. No matter how entertaining a movie may be, at some point the question will be, when is it going to end? Friends, it is all about time. In a world where the Bible is being demolished, and replaced with the prosperity gospel, the question is, when is it going to end? It is all about time. The time has come, I would say today, for the most relevant message of the ages to be proclaimed. The time has come. We are living in a day and age where what God has commissioned for us to proclaim to the world, the time has come for the most relevant message of the ages, the three angels' messages. In a world where atheists deny and scoffers disregard the imminence of the return of Jesus, the question is, when is scoffing going to end? When is atheism going to end? The climate is ripe for the most urgent message of the hour. In a world where political correctness has given birth to powerless preaching, the question once again is, when is powerless preaching going to end? That's why the last days call for the reintroduction of the most meaningless message of the hour, heaven's message, the three angels' message. The question is why? For you see, the three angels' messages rips the blanket from complacency, demanding a recalibration of our purpose. It asks the question, who are we and why are we here? Why has God raised up a remnant church? Why has God raised up a church where his commandments are honored and kept? It demands a recalibration of our purpose. 
It says it's too late just to be a Christian, to enjoy Christian entertainment and Christian movies and Christian music. This is not the hour of entertainment. It is an hour demanding the recalibration of our purpose. It reminds us that the time has come for this long and meaningless world to finally come to an end. I say it again. It is all about time. God has told us that it is all about time. The Apostle Paul shines his flashlight on one of the most overlooked counsels we find in the book of First Thessalonians. Notice how the Apostle Paul focuses on the fact that it is all about time. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, we read, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Oh, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, those watching this broadcast, we are standing on the cuspid, and just over the horizon is rising the final movements in this earth's history. There is a merging together of Daniel and Revelation and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel and the prophets of old and the prophets of the New Testament, the apostles, are all screaming from, as it were, their place of rest. The time has come. These times should not catch the people of God by surprise. These times will never catch the people of the book by surprise because everything that the prophets have said, everything that the apostles have forecasted is taking place before us. It's all about time. And when you study God's Word, we don't have to guess about where we are and what's taking place in history because the Bible is a reliable guide that synchronizes us to heaven's clock. I like that, synchronized to heaven's clock, not to man's agenda, not to a political agenda, not to a social agenda, not to a financial agenda, not even to a religious agenda, but our minds are synchronized to heaven's clock, to the agenda that God has prescribed. When you consider the evidence, when you look at the Word of God and consider the evidence, it is unmistakable that we are living in the time of the end. Notice the Apostle Paul's word to that young man by the name of Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, look with me as we understand that we are living in the time foretold by the faithful apostles. He says these words to this generation. But know this, that in the last days, notice, the last days, let me, let me precursor that by saying this, the last days, everything that I read from this point on, you will be able to see in the environment in which we live, indicating that the time has come, that we are living in the last days. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Let me rephrase that, they have come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Listen, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, how accurate are his words, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. He's describing a world gone mad, brutal, despisers of good. But he goes on. I wish I could stop here, but he goes on. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These are those who say, give us a 15-minute message or a 30-minute message, but they watch a two-and-a-half-hour football game, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These are those that binge all weekend long watching their favorite soap operas or their favorite movies. Give me a short message. Don't give me too much God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And the Bible gives the antidotal prescription of who they are. It begins to diagnose their condition. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And then we are told, from such, turn away. But he continues the condition of even those whose hearts are corrupt. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of, gu of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led, by, led away by various lusts. And what's the problem? Here's what he says. In every capacity, religious and political, we have more knowledge, but notice what the apostle says, always learning 
and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. These are those that can forecast the weather a week in advance or 10 days in advance, but they cannot see the climate that surrounds us. They cannot see the crumbling political society. They cannot see the immorality that is now applauded. They cannot see the debasing movies being produced and people standing in line for hours to push, to push into their minds these things that corrupt their soul. They cannot see that in a society where we're pushing religion on one side, but those same persons who claim that they want religion in society will stand idly by when corruption streams on the internet, when pornography brims into the households and the minds of young men and young women, they'll stand by and do nothing, when cigarette smoking, marijuana is being passed as a law, and homosexuality is now made a, nation, a national law and a worldwide acceptance. These individuals, having a form of godliness, always learning, but never able to, the, to come to the knowledge of the truth. What truth? The truth as it is in Jesus. The time has come. Perilous times have come. Somewhere I read that soon grievous troubles will arise among our nations. And my brothers and sisters, if you are living as I am in the time of this COVID environment, you will never believe, you could never have imagined that the nations of the world are all locked in the same troubles. But we are told that these troubles will not cease until Jesus comes. When you look around the world, you'll see the judgments of God are already in the land. Fire and flood and earthquake and disaster. Things that men cannot control. Flagrations that cannot be controlled by airplanes or by fire trucks. Out of control. Judgments of God letting men know that the only way that they can find safety is turn to God at this very hour of decision. And all these things will increase letting us know that the end is very near and we have no time to lose. When I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, I said to myself, I've read this before, but God has given me new eyes and a fresh understanding. And every description in those verses is true. But the danger, the danger is this. Many that believe those words have become desensitized to its impact. Let me repeat that. They have become desensitized. I know there are those watching that say, well, I've heard that before. I've read 2 Timothy myself. In the King James Version, the New King James Version, the NIV, that's not the issue. The issue is when you hear God calling us to the urgency of the hour, but we become desensitized because we've heard it before, that's the greater danger. It's not that you've heard it. It's not that you believe it, but what is your reaction to it? It is too late to become desensitized when the angels are rushing to and fro, returning with the report, my work is done. When God is sending forth his angels, examining the hearts and lives of those who claim to be Christians, and you are desensitized. The world is designed to lull its inhabitants to sleep. Christians, beware. We live in a world designed to lull its inhabitants to sleep, but we cannot allow the world to lull Christians to sleep. The Apostle Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6. Notice this short but profound injection among the sleeping Christian church. He said, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. It's too late. In a country where you can choose your brand of Christianity, the Lord is saying it's not about your brand of Christianity it's about what God's Word has told us. It's about what God's Word warns us is coming. And there are those that would rather have good music. Let's go to church and feel good. Let's raise our hands but lower our standards. Let's listen to the music but ignore what God says. Let's keep our 10 promises but ignore God's 10 commandments. Let's put together things that make us enjoy church but not enjoy righteous living. My brothers and sisters, let us not sleep as others do, but may the church rise on the ashes of a world that's burning up beneath our feet. Let the church awake. It is too late for us to sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And Jesus unites with the words of the Apostle Paul, or shall I say, the Apostle Paul seconds the words of Jesus. As Jesus said in Mark 13, verse 33, he warned his disciples. He said, take heed. He said, take heed. In other words, be careful. Watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. 
You don't understand the workings of heaven. I've given you a job to do. It is not up to you to know the times and seasons, but understand this. I've given you a work. I will control the harvest. I will send the early and latter rain. That's not your concern. You know, there are many people that are saying, when will Jesus come? How can we lock it down to a specific time in history? That's not your job. That's not your concern. He says, understand the signs of the times. What does he mean? When it starts getting warmer, we know the spring is on the way. When it starts getting hot, we know the summer's on the way. When we begin to see the leaves fall from the trees, we know the fall is on the way. And when the mornings begin with that wintry chill, we know that winter is on its way. Pay attention to the climate around you. Understand that God is speaking to us in tones of urgency. He says, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Uh, my brethren, there's an evil force at work. There are fallen angels with your name on their hit list. And their aim is to cause us to not just believe it, but they don't want us to follow it. Satan's aim is to get us to believe that we have more time. Look at the words of the wise man. In Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 12, notice what he says, and know how true this is. He says in verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 9, For man does not know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare. So the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Wealthy people, I got all I need, but they don't know that there's a grave six feet wide and six feet deep with their name on it. They're tombstones, and some people are so wealthy, they, 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 they title their, their buildings after them. They call themselves the Hearst Castle. Well, the Hearst Castle, don't forget, the Hearst Castle one day was followed by the hearse. Even the wealthiest of men, there's a grave with their name on it. Don't get caught up in the times. It's so sad when we hear about people that are famous. They die just like poor people die. And everyone must one day stand in the judgment to give a, an account for how they've spent their time. They think to themselves, I've got great wealth and time is on my side. But notice David the psalmist pulls their coattail. As a matter of fact, this passage, my wife and I are reading our Bibles together. And this passage jumped out on the page together as we read the Bible in our morning devotions. Psalm 49, verse 11. Listen to how the wealthy and the powerful think. The Bible says, Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. That's why when wealthy people die, they have an entire state, an entire estate. It's called whatever you want to call it. Give whatever name you can give to it. But wealthy people die and leave thousands of acres. They put their names on the gate. You walk through the gate onto their lands, but they're not there because somewhere there's a hole in the ground and they're waiting for the resurrection morning. Oh, my brothers and sisters, don't allow this meaningless world to have you sit down for 48 hours watching the world pass you by only to arise from your seat saying, what have I seen? Nothing but meaningless entertainment, loving you to sleep, not understanding the time in which we live. Don't think that your wealth can buy you time. Don't think that because you have all great possessions that you are above the person who has nothing because we must all one day stand before the judgment seat of God. And this is the hour, unlike any other. What world do you know that has ever existed like this present world? locked down, sequestered, quarantined. We cannot function like a normal society. God is saying this is just a precursor of the world as it's going to become. But another indication about the time of the end is man's attitude toward truth. Man's attitude toward truth. Can I even go a step further? The attitude that some Christians have toward truth. Second Timothy Chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Notice the words of the Apostle Paul once again to this young man to whom he was passing the mantle. He said, for the time will come, and can I say the time has come, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They don't want to hear the truth. They will heap up for themselves teachers. That you can pick a teacher, tell you what you want to hear, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. Well, I'm not one of those preachers. 
If you want to hear the truth, come to me. If you don't want to hear the truth, don't come to me because I'm going to tell you the truth. And I praise God as I look through the internet. I praise God. I see my brothers. I see my fellow pastors and evangelists around the world. I am not the only one. I'm not caught into the quagmire of Elijah thinking I'm the only one. There are 7,000 more that have not bowed their knees to Baal. Keep preaching it, brother. Keep teaching it, my sister. Keep standing firm on it. Thus saith the Lord. Because we live in a generation where religion has become inoculated, so sleepy have many of them become that the moment you say, let me tell you what God's Word says, I've had pastors say, I don't want to hear it. They're locked into their own fables. They have entertained themselves into the complacency of religion and forget that to be a disciple, you've got to deny yourself. It's not about what you prefer to teach. It's about what God's Word has says. And the danger is, if the watchman who has been called to keep God's people alive and safe sees the sword coming but prefer entertainment rather than calling it like it is. One day the blood of your congregation will be at your hand. One day you'll have to stand up and give an account for what God has told you to say but you've refused because it's not popular. I'm not a popular preacher. I don't want to be a popular preacher. If my name never makes it to the world stage, as long as I stand on God's stage, that's all that matters to me. I want to hear well done, as one of my favorite preachers, Pastor Walter Pearson, said, the two best words ever to be uttered to the human race would be well done. That's what I want to hear. Not good job, not great sermon, not good song, but well done, thou good and faithful servant. We live in deceptive times, and unfortunately, many millions have become acclimated to those things that make them feel good. Tell people about the Sabbath. Just test it out. Tell somebody about the Bible Sabbath, the Seventh-day Sabbath. Well, I prefer Sunday. Tell somebody that you don't die and go to heaven, but you rest till Jesus comes. That's what the Bible says. But they'll grab their favorite Bible verse, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and they'll ignore all the other 55 references to what happens when you die. Tell people that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him, but they've swallowed a lie, spun by Rome during the Dark Ages, that there's going to be a secret rapture somewhere even Time Magazine and, and National Geographic did an expose a few years ago saying, this is the greatest spun deceptive teaching, but millions rather believe that somehow, just before the world spirals to its death, that God is going to snatch them away and just, they're going to vanish. Nothing is further from the truth. Did the Israelites vanish from Egypt when the plagues fell? No, they were covered by the blood of the Lamb. God wants to cover you. He doesn't want to snatch you out. He says, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation that will come upon the entire world. My brothers and my sisters, don't get caught in deceptive times because Dr. Luke says in Luke 17, verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. What happened in those days? Men did not believe, and they still don't want to believe. Pick a church. Pick a denomination and line them up with the test, the acid test of God's words, and you'll find that you'll be able to see that one denomination after the other, one movement after the other, will fall off the table of integrity to God's word by simply applying the scriptural test. The Bible says, to the law and to the testimony, Isaiah 8 and verse 20, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. I didn't say that. God said that. God's word says in 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. But preachers say he was nailed to the cross. Well, my brother, if you believe that commandments of God are nailed to the cross, close your church and sell watermelons and balloons. Why call people to give up sin if there's no commandment to define sin? He says in verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a lie, and the truth is not in him. I didn't say that. God said that. Apply the acid test, because you will one day stand before God and have to give an account for those you have led astray for financial purposes or popularity reasons. I don't need a stadium of 30,000 people. I just need one sincere person that wants to be the individual that God will ignite in these dark times to let the light of God's truth shine to the world in darkness. Noah's day is just like our day. Our day. Men didn't believe when Noah preached, and they don't believe when we preach. But we're going to keep preaching because as sure as the flood is coming, Jesus is coming again. 
Luke 17, verse 28, he continues. Not only Noah's day, but what about Lot's day? Jesus continues, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold. Let me pause. You can't go out and eat. You can't go out and drink. The bars are closed. The restaurants are closed. You can't go to the mall. You can't even buy. You can't even sell. Nobody wants to buy anything in these COVID-19 times. That's the kind of world they planted and they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It's coming again. Sodom was just a microcosm of how God feels about immorality, how God feels about homosexuality. And even though it has been given the stamp of legitimate approval by the government, what's honored among, uh, what's honored among men, what's highly esteemed among men, is a reproach to God. The standard is not legislation. The standard is, thus saith the Lord. In the days of Lot, immorality and homosexuality was rampant and accepted. In the days of Lot are here again. The time has come. Romans 1, verse 27, Paul summarizes the days of Lot. He says, likewise, also the man, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. It's amazing to me. My wife and I were watching television the other day, watching the news, watching the news. And along comes a commercial. And at the very end of the commercial, two men kiss. And we, we got disgusted, disgusted. But they're pushing it from the right and from the left. And amazingly enough, from the right and from the left, you know we have in America, we have the left and the right. Well, nobody from the left or the right is standing up against this filth. And we talk about men of moral character. In every generation, God had a message of urgency. In Noah's generation, God chose Noah to warn the world of an approaching flood. He warned them, they didn't listen, but the record is clear, a great deluge encompassed this entire planet. Lot was called to warn his family of the demise of Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't listen. Only Lot and his two daughters escaped. His wife, almost on the way out, looked back, and you know the rest of the story. She became a, a, a permanent pillar of salt, looking back when God said, don't look back. In the days of Moses, he was chosen to proclaim a promised land-focused message. And those who came out of Egypt did not all make it into, into the promised land. Why? Because along the way, like today, they became enamored even in the wilderness. They longed for what Egypt had given to them, the way that Egypt entertained, the way that Egypt ate, the way that Egypt dressed. Oh, my brothers and sisters, don't adopt Egypt. It's too late. The promised land is just over the mountain. Keep on moving forward in Christ. In John the Baptist's day, he was chosen to say, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Notice every generation, Noah, Lot, Moses, and John the Baptist, just to name a few. But God has called us in this generation to stand in the gap because the time has come. Notice the words of Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. He said to Daniel, he gave Daniel an understanding of what was coming, but he said, wait a minute. Hide it, because when the time comes, it'll be clearly understood. But here's what you need to do, Daniel. Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until, get it, the time of the end. Let me say it again. The time has come. And he says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge increasing? We have more knowledge today biblically and intellectually than any other generation. These are not the days of ignorance. But the problem is not the knowledge we have, but what we do about the knowledge we have. You see, intellect is one thing. That's called knowledge. But you need wisdom to know what to do with your intellect. People think that knowledge is power. No, knowledge is not power. Your response to knowledge determines the power that follows you. If you respond in a secular mind, you don't have any power. Power is temporary on a secular plane, but when you respond on a spiritual plane, you stand behind the one who has all power. That's Christ. These are not the days of ignorance. But even more than that, even more than Noah and John and Lot and, 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 and all the messages they proclaimed then, 
Here's another message, a more contemporary message, found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, a message for these times, these times. Look with me to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, the message of the three angels. They are called the everlasting gospel. Here is what the Bible says in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Where? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In verse 7, whispering, oh no, wait a minute, let me say that again, saying with a loud voice. Why a loud voice? When people raise their voice, it's an indication of urgency. When the fire trucks come down the road, they don't, they don't have a little, a little bell on their, on their bicycle handle. They have a foghorn. It's a message of urgency. When sirens go on off, go off warning of a coming tornado or hurricane or some kind of cataclysmic event, it's intended for everyone to hear. This message is intended for everyone to hear. Why? For God so loved the world. Notice what the Bible says, saying with a loud voice. What is it saying? Fear God. Every nation, fear God and give him glory. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him. It's all about worship. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The time has come for your worship. For your worship not to be something ordained by humanity, but guided by divinity. What does that mean? John 4, verse 23 and 24, Jesus said, For the hour is coming. For the hour is coming. The Lord is looking for people that want to worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? For the Father is seeking such to worship. The hour is coming that we must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, let me make this very clear. Some people say the Spirit told me this or the Spirit told me that. Let me make something very clear, my brother. You can't say you're being led by the Spirit if you ignore the truth. Because the Spirit is not an either or. The Spirit doesn't conflict with Christ. The Holy Spirit is sent by Christ to continue the mission of Christ. He does not say, well, all you need is feeling, but you don't need truth. Oh, no. Spirit and in truth. When you have both combined together, you are on a sure foundation, a foundation that will not fail. But the movements of these last days are in progress. There's a movement in progress that will soon take this sleeping world by storm. But God has given his last day messengers the commission to warn the world. You might think I'm excited. No, I'm urgent. This is not emotional excitement. This is understanding the call on my life. This is understanding what God has called me to do. This is not excitement nor emotion. I see the sword coming. I've got to warn you. I see where the world is headed. God has told me to tell you. And buried in the midst of those three angels' messages, buried in the center of those three angels' messages, is a message of warning about worship. Look at Revelation 14, verse 9 and verse 10. The Bible says, Then a third angel followed them, saying once again with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And what is God going to do? And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Let me pause and ask the question, what could cause God to be so aroused with, with a strength where his wrath is undiluted? What can cause God to say, this is not the time that I'm going to dilute my attitude toward this movement? Because the beast, who is that beast? The image, what is that image? You got to stay tuned for part two next Sabbath. You got to stay tuned for part two. You cannot miss it. The final coalition is going to give you the answers, but I'm going to lay some foundation today that will get you calibrated. God is saying from the very beginning, Satan said, I will be like the Most High, and he has put in place in the earth a system leading men and women in the wrong direction. And he's saying, don't go there, because when this system has been fully erect, as it was in the days of Daniel, as it was in the days of the three Hebrew worthies when they stood on Babylon's plain and an image was set up 
and they were told they must worship for fear of death, they decided to stand firm in the midst of a powerful, presumptuous kingdom. And God deliver them. My brother and my sister, don't fear the powers of earth. Fear the powers of heaven. Fear God and give glory to him. He's the only one that can cause the fire to cool when the world says they'll heat it seven times hotter. He is the only one that can call the lines by their names and say, you're not hungry for Daniel. You're hungry for those deceivers. I'll give you them on the menu next. Stand for that which is true. But there's a movement on the way that will take the world by storm. Why? Because they're sleeping at the post. Many churches today have leaders that are sleeping at the post. But just before Revelation chapter 14 is Revelation chapter 13, where a merger is to take place between two powers that once opposed each other. Let me make it very clear. Where a merger is going to take place between two powers that once opposed each other. You see, America was raised up to protect Christianity from the influence of the Dark Ages, the Church of Rome. America was raised up. God protected this country. God raised this country up to give us two things that we now take lightly. But I'm going to make it clear where we're headed. It's so vitally important for the church to understand that America, this Protestant nation, the word Protestant, the word Protestant has been replaced with the word evangelical. Why have we gotten rid of the word Protestant? Ask Kenneth Copeland. He said the protest is over. Tony Palmer, the messenger from Pope Francis, said the protest was over, but he lost his life. Kenneth Copeland says the protest is over. Do we want to be known as protesters? Yes. When I have to protest against error, I will be known as a protester. If I have to protest against darkness, I will be known as a, as a protester. This is not about cre creating division for the purpose of division. This is about creating division between light and darkness, between truth and error. Yes, we mu must protest darkness. Yes, we must protest error. We're living in that day and age. And the Bible predicts that in this country, the same power that was behind the church of the dark ages, that monolith, the church of Rome, will soon manifest itself in Protestant America because Protestantism has been pushed out and the phrase or the word evangelical has taken over. I hope you're awake. I'm going to peel back your insensitivities today. You see, in spite of the church's closing for COVID-19, at least right now, we still have the freedom to worship according to our own dictates. However, the question is, where are we in Bible prophecy? Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. Look at how Daniel brings out the characteristics of the first beast that we're going to see in just a moment in Revelation chapter 13. Daniel makes it clear. God gave Daniel a dream. And Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, he said, After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast. He already went through the lion, the bear, and the leopard. But now his attention is turned to a fourth beast. What kind of beast? dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Ten horns. When you follow the cadence of Bible prophecy, when you understand how prophecy unfolds, one of my favorite topics in high school was world history. I loved world history, and that was the foundation that later on God touched to get me to understand my love for Bible prophecy, to ignite my love for Bible prophecy. World history will bear out and verify and affirm what I'm about to share with you. There were only four great empires in the world, Babylon, the greatest, the most magnificent empire led by that, 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 that fervent leader by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, but it began on the plains on the other side of the flood when they built a tower, the Tower of Babel, in distrust to the promises of God, trying to save themselves by their works. But God brought that tower down. But in its place, a great kingdom came up, a golden kingdom, a lion kingdom, the, the nation, the, the, the kingdom of Babylon. But it came down. That's why Daniel said, after this I saw in the night vision a fourth beast. That kingdom came down. The Medo-Persians brought that down by God's direction. But they came down. 
That was the kingdom that tried to persecute Daniel and put him in the lion's den. But they came down, and God replaced the Medo-Persian Empire with the Grecian Empire. You know heard about it. Alexander the Great, one of the greatest generals that ever lived, but he could not conquer his alcoholism and died in his 30s. But God said there's a fourth kingdom that's coming. And when you follow what I'm about to share with you, you'll discover that this fourth kingdom is still in operation today because the Bible didn't give five world empires. It gave four. It gave four. Look at verse 23 of Daniel chapter 7. What does the Bible say? Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. Oh, I could hear the questions coming up. How is Rome going to devour the whole earth? Well, hang on, my brother and my sister. It's coming. How will Rome, how will this monolithic system of religion devour the whole earth when it's located just in Italy, in the Vatican City? How could that little power devour the entire earth? Well, put your hat on. Open your ears up. Think back. What other power do you know that exists on earth? Religious and political merge together. What other power do you know on this planet? Every time something happens in, on the category of cat catastrophe or disaster, who appears on the news? A representative of this system. They don't call an Adventist or a Baptist. They always call a clergy from the Catholic Church. And by the way, let me make something very clear. I am not talking about Catholic people. God has his followers in every church. But let me make it very clear, my brother. Wherever you are, God is going to call you out if it's not a place of truth. Wherever you may be as you're listening to this message, God is not content to leave you there. Jesus said in John 10, 16, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, but he said, Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there'll be one fold and one shepherd. So don't pacify yourself saying, I'm safe. If you're not where the truth is being proclaimed, Jesus is saying, come out. If you're not where the truth is being proclaimed, Jesus says, I've got other sheep that are not of this fold, and I'm going to call them out. There'll be only one fold and one shepherd. Look at the Bible. In the New Testament, there was only the, the Jews and the Gentiles, those who accepted truth and those who did not want truth. But Satan has so diversified the playing field that people think that whatever religion you are is safe, such is the case only in the kingdom of darkness. God has people everywhere, but God does not endorse every movement that has the label Christian. But this world is about to be thrown into a spin cycle that it didn't even see coming. And no other power on earth fits the description of this fourth kingdom other than the power of Rome. And I say the power of Rome because it doesn't matter who the Pope is. It could be Pope John Paul. It could be Pope Benedict. It could be Pope Francis. It could be Pope John I. It doesn't matter who the Pope is. The system itself, in the very same way, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. The Bible has outlined the agenda of America, and you'll see in just a moment where I'm headed. This world is about to be coalesced together. And I don't mind coalition, but as long as that unity is created by the truth of God's word. I don't mind being unified. Jesus prayed for unity in John 17, but he never prayed for unity on ideologies that ignore a plain, thus saith the Lord. It's not about social, financial, political, or religious power. It is about God's word. No other power has the secular and religious authority like the power of Rome. That's why the Bible says it'll be different from all other kingdoms. Different in what sense? It's a religio-political power. The ten horns that Daniel talked about in Daniel 7 shows up again in Revelation chapter 13. You see, here's the point. In order to appreciate and understand the accuracy and timing of Bible prophecy, it is imperative for us to understand Two things. Who is the first beast and who is behind him? Look at Revelation chapter 13, and I'm beginning with verse 1 and then verse 2. Notice what the Bible says. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name, you never get a blasphemous name if you didn't do something against the name of Christ. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. 
and who's behind him. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Revelation 12 verse 9 tells us who the dragon is. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Get it? Satan is into deceiving the entire world, so he sets up a system to carry out religious deception. He sets up a system that will merge politically and religiously to pull all of humanity, whether socially, financially, politically, or religiously, under the same roof. Why does it give the description of the leopard, the bear, and the lion? You see, the leopard represents the kingdom of Greece. The bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire. The lion represents Babylon. In short, the leopard was swift, the bear was ruthless, and the lion was fearless and powerful. All of these things merged in the fourth beast who's great and dreadful and terrible, and he has teeth that will never get a cavity. Great iron teeth, meaning there's nothing that could stand the crushing power of this monolith described in history as the power of Rome. The power of Rome received a brief wound in 1798. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. I talked about it. It merged again on the other side. You see, God brought America up in 1776. And for about 22 or 23 years later, God brought Rome down. 22 years later, 1776, America came up, declared its independence, declared its freedom from what? The tyrannies of Europe. And 22 years later, God brought the power of Rome to its knees. And for some time, for more than 100 years, that power would remain dormant. But the Bible says not only what would happen to it, but how it will recover. Revelation 13, verse 3. The Bible says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And what happened? And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, follow me carefully. I'm going to preach, teach. In order for the world to follow Rome, something has to happen. How can Rome encompass, how can Rome come into a country like America where evangelicalism is a higher level of count? In other words, in the population of America, there's more evangelicals in America than in the world. But outside of America, outside of America, there are more Catholics than evangelicals. So what's going to happen? What will possibly happen for this prophecy to be fulfilled for all the world to follow and marvel after the power of Rome? Revelation 13, verse 11. Look with me. We saw the first piece of Revelation 13. Now let's see the second one. The Bible says, Then I saw another beast, Coming up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, wait a minute. Two horns like a lamb, a lamb-like beast speaking like a dragon? What an unusual, ironic, catastrophic contrast. A lamb-like beast speaking like a dragon? How is that possible? Let me make it very clear what the two, two horns are. When America came up, God gave America something we still enjoy today, religious liberty, and a government that's based on a republic by the people for the people. It's a, it's, a, it's a grassroots movement from the bottom up. Rome was the top down. But not too far from now. This very nation that gives us freedom, and by the way, it's already being suggested, it's already being suggested that we should suspend the rights of our Constitution in this COVID-19 environment, do your homework. It's already being suggested that we should suspend our constitutional rights in the midst of this COVID-19 environment. But look at Great Controversy, page 441. Follow me carefully. The lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol points to a striking contradiction between the profession of the practice of the nation thus represented. That's America. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authority. By such actions, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles. Sorry, yeah. By such action, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles which it has put forth as the foundation of its policy. The prediction that it will speak, quote, as a dragon, end quote, and exercise all the power of the first beast, 
plainly foretells a development of the spiritual, of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that will be manifested by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. Let me pause right there. That's saying, this very country, how can this country that seems to be so tolerant flip and become completely intolerant? Let me continue. And the statement that the beast with two horns causeth the earth and them which dwell in it to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in forcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. Now follow this. In this COVID-19 environment, now we're seeing the, 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 the positive aspects to resting. The waters of Italy are clear. The mountains of India are clear. The skies of L.A. are clear. We're seeing the environmental benefits. And not only, are that, not only is this being seen by econ, uh, people that are climatologists and meteorolo meteorologists, but it's also being seen by religionists. And they're already suggesting that we should have a single day where we all get together and rest. Why? Because we all have a common home, the earth. But make no mistake about it, while they may make suggestions that seem to be mild and apparently Christian, they have no clue about the undercurrent. In Revelation 13, verse 12, is the antithesis of Revelation 13, verse 3. You see, Protestants fled from Europe, from the power of Rome. However, in less than 300 years after the split with Rome, Protestants are now seeking ways to return. Do your homework. Listen to the political leaders that are on the top stages of America. Listen to your evangelical famous voices. Kenneth Copeland. Listen to people like Rick Warren. Rick Warren says, we have more in common with Rome than we do not have in common. But amazingly enough, about 200 years ago, that would never be said, not in a nation that fled from the tyranny of Europe. But I'm making it clear today. Revelation 13, verse 12. Look what the Bible says about America. Look what the Bible says about a nation that presently gives us the freedom of worship and the freedom to vote. And the Bible says, and he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence or before him and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Wow. Let's take that in for a moment. America causing the world. America influence in the world. Well, it's unmistakably clear that America sees itself as the single most prominent, powerful nation of the world, politically and militarily and financially. Un unashamedly, they boast of their power. And as, a, as an American, I would say that's unequivocal. Yes, we set the pace for the world. We sneeze, the world catches a cold. America is the world's most influential political, social, and financial power. But it's not the world's most influential religious power. Rome is. So America has to get the most influential power in the area of religion to institute its social norms, its new financial norms, its new political norms, and its new religious base. And by the way, friends, you ought to do your homework. That's why the, relig that's why the religious right has come up in place of the moral majority. And today we have a new movement in America called Dominion Theology. You see, on the horizon is a rising religious power base in America that believes it is their appointed mission to control America politically and the world religiously. And that is exactly what Rome did during the Dark Ages. Evangelicals are seeking to implement the same principles, not in America alone, but in the world. And here is a summary of their mission. It is called Dominion Theology. There is the reference. Political Research Associates, August 18, 2016. That's when they noticed this movement coming up. But this same movement and this same ideology was embraced by those pushing to be candidates that Donald Trump was able to overcome. And I will tell you why. Because God does not and will not allow the agenda of man to rush ahead of the agenda of heaven. It's called a theocratic movement hiding in plain sight. Notice the three principles of dominion theology. Dominionists celebrate Christian nationalism. Have you heard the word nationalism much? In that they believe that the United States once was and should once again be 
a Christian nation. In this way, they deny the Enlightenment roots of American democracy. What does that mean? They deny the idea that America should still be a nation where they offer religious liberty and freedom to everybody. No wonder there's such hatred against other religions practicing in America. Because according to their theology and their beliefs is we should be the only ones controlling America. Look at the cadence of history. They made the attempt under Ronald Reagan, but they failed. And this is the second attempt. But look at the second point of dominion theology. Dominionists promote religious supremacy. Insofar as they generally do not respect the equality of other religions or even other versions of Christianity, Unless you abide by the dominion theology views, you are not respected as a viable religion that will be given the right to continue after this system takes hold of the religious base of America. A sad reality. How else can they cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship? The issue is about two things, time and worship. And the third principle. Dominionists endorse theocratic visions insofar as they believe that the Ten Commandments or biblical law should be the foundation of American law and that the US Constitution should be seen as a vehicle for implementing biblical principles. Do your homework. That's why you have people in this present administration that they use their religious beliefs to campaign around the world when they are sent as, as religious ambassadors. Not religious ambassadors, but political ambassadors. Why would political representatives of our government use their religious influence to manipulate movements around our planet. Why? Dominion theology. Christian nationalism is taking America by storm. It looks at America as a place where it will form its dominion and its variance, and it has a vision for all nations. My brother, evangelical leaders are pushing for unity with the Church of Rome. Why? Because evangelicals dominate America but Catholicism dominates the world. And there is no way that you can dominate the world unless you join hands with the one who dominates the world. You give me something, I'll give you something. Revelation 17, verse 13. Why is this happening? Notice the Bible speaks again. Praise God. We don't have to guess. Revelation, 13, Revelation 17, verse 13. Here's what God said. These are of one mind. They all think dominance. They all think control politically and religiously. Why? And they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will unite with Rome. Because you know why? The Bible said it. And I believe the Bible is supreme above any opinion that you may embrace. The Bible said it. Let me tell you why. It's about timing. Let me make it very clear. God knows that we are living in the closing hours of earth's history and what God has foretold in the annals of biblical prophecy must come to pass. Praise God. I can see it happening. If John the Revelator was alive today, how he would rejoice. If Daniel was alive today, he would occupy the street corners of America saying what I saw is happening today. God is in control. Revelation 17 verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. Why do they think that way? When you reject truth, remember Paul says God will send them strong delusion. Here's how he did it. When you reject truth, God takes over. And Bible says in Revelation 17, 17, for God has put it into their minds to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until, watch this, until the words of God are fulfilled. Whose words? Not man's words, not social words, not political words, not financial words, but God's word to be fulfilled. Praise God. He is still in charge. God is still on the throne. The time has come for the marvelous working of God on the heels of what's coming next. This two-horned beast of Revelation 13 is going to merge. Catholicism and evangelicalism in the United States are orchestrating an agenda that will unite politics and religion first in America. Look at the Vatican News, January 16, 2019. Look what Pope Francis says. Pope Francis has reminded the faithful that ecumenism, that's meaning the merging of religions together, is not something optional. Again, this year, 
we are called to pray so that all Christians may once again be a single family. And then he says, according to God's will, so that they may all be one, he said, pointing out that ecumenism is not something optional. What? Not optional. Here's what I say is not optional, but God didn't say that. He said it. In other words, you don't have a choice. We must accomplish this, and America is going to make that happen. American evangelicals are going to make that happen because right now they are seeking with tooth and nail. Listen, tune your ears to what is being said on the news broadcast. They're tuning their agendas. They're fine-tuning the points of unity. But I'm going to make a point right here that as before, before I close. I've got to make this point very clear. For there to be a complete healing of the wound, whatever has caused the wound has to be reversed for the wound to be healed. Let me make it clear. When Rome received its wound in 1798 and lost its power temporarily, a wound was created between Rome and Protestants. A wound. From 1929, when the Vatican was given that city, by Benito Mussolini, the Italian representative. The wound began to be healed, but it cannot be fully healed until what caused the wound has been reversed. And under, pre under the present climate, even though in 1994 there was a document called Evangelicals and Catholics Together in the New Millennium, in 1994 they signed a, a joint document leading evangelicals and Catholic scholars to examine the points where they can unify in America. In America, 1994. They are farther ahead of that agenda now than they were in 1994. But amazingly enough, notice some things that may be coincidental, but I believe they have a place in the pages of God's timetable. You see, the Vatican City was given to the Church of Rome, and that document was signed on February 11th, 1929. The wound was not healed, it began to be healed. Coincidental, February 11th. What else happened on February 11th? On February 11th, 2015, Pope Benedict resigned, making way for Pope Francis, February 11th. Coincidental, what else happened on February 11th? It was on February 11th, 2020, when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. It may be completely coincidental, or God may be saying, look at the cadence, look at the cadence, look at the cadence, wake up, look at the cadence. Coincidental, it may be to you, but God is speaking to his people. When you listen to God's word, coincidence is the voice of God. Coincidence in your mind is the voice of God in somebody else's. When evangelical America reaches out to join hands with the leaders that will bring us together with Rome, we will know how near we are to the end. Look at verse 12 of Revelation chapter 13. I say it again. And he, America, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, beast whose deadly wound was healed. America, that's where we are headed as a nation. But listen, listen to the words of inspiration. In the book, Faith of Our Fathers, page 310 and paragraph 3. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss, the dwelling place of Satan, to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, what threefold union? Catholicism, Protestantism, and spiritualism shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, the two horns. What's going to happen? And shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. It would not take anything for people to unite on Sunday. Why? Because in Catholicism and Protestantism, they have already merged on the day. The Bible says, then we may know that the time has come. Look, my brethren, the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. 
my brother and my sister. The end is near. Not the beginning of the end. That was a long time ago. The beginning of the end began a long time ago. We're living in the toenails of the image of Daniel 2. We're living in the feet of that image. We're living on the tip of the teeth of the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. We're living right between Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 and 12 and soon America. Listen to what's being, being propagated in the political circles. Listen. This nation is pushing with all the power it has. And right now evangelicals have more power than they have had in more than 30 years in America. And it has always been their aim, either under the moral majority or the religious right, but now under dominion theology, to pull America back in favor with Rome. That's why, my brothers and my sisters, my next message will be titled, The Final Coalitions. Christians, my appeal to you is wake up. Non-Christians, my appeal to you is wake up. The final coalition will include the largest social, political, financial, and religious system ever understood since the world began. And it's on its way. And we are warned to remain attentive to the times. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. What should we do? What should we do understanding the times in which we live? The Bible says, and do this, knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. This is the time, my brother. Now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The good news is Jesus is coming again. I said it. In a, in a society that doesn't want to hear about Jesus, I'm going to say it. Noah, the flood is coming. Lot, the city is coming down. John the Baptist, make the way for the Lord. Elijah, talk about it. Jesus is coming again. Yes, He's not just coming again. He's on his way. He's giving us signs that the world is folding up. He's giving us indications that politically, socially, financially, and religiously, there's a merger taking place. My brother, my Adventist pastor, preached this message. My clergy, stop trying to preach popular messages. Get back to the everlasting gospel. Get back to the message that will awaken your community, that will rouse your church from sleep that will cause your members to stand up to the hour in which we live. This is the time. The time has come. So as I pray, my prayer is that you've not only heard this message, but that you respond and do something about it, that you begin to clean out your life, your closet, that you begin to brush off and take your spiritual garments to the cleaners and say, Lord Jesus, cover me by the blood of the Lamb that you begin to understand where you stand with Christ and know that this is not an hour to parley with. This is not an hour to sword fight with another opponent power, but this is the hour to stand where Christ is standing on the foundation of unshakable truth, reliable, the Word of God, reliable, the leading of the Spirit of God. Don't be content with just worship that brings a feeling, but find your contentment in the truth of the thus saith the Lord. Pastors, I challenge you. Leaders, I challenge you. Political leaders, I challenge you. Don't fall down the crevice of popular movements in America. Stand on a thus saith the Lord. So that when Jesus comes, the two most delightful words that will ever be spoken to humanity is, well done. I want to hear it, and I pray that by God's grace, we will hear it together. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The time has come. Come, let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, the time has come. The prophets are screaming from their place of rest. The time has come. If they could wrestle in their graves, they would stand on their feet. The time has come, Lord. Breathe upon this valley of dry bones. Breathe upon your people that they may stand up as a great army in a time where armies are scarce in a time when Christians are blending in to the woodwork around them, in, in, a, in a society where we can't tell the difference between the, between the wallpaper of the world and the wallpaper of the church, Father, may we stand out. May the light shine bright in this darkness. May the message be clear and the trumpet give a certain sound. 
And may we, unashamed of the gospel of Christ, offer salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone to every sinner, every believer, every person filled without hope, every person looking for answers in this dark society. Today, Jesus is the answer. And by embracing him, by receiving him, you'll have that blessed assurance that no matter, no matter what happens politically or socially or financially or religiously, you will have a sure foundation in Christ. And when this storm has passed over, when this final storm that is rapidly coming finally passes, there will be a sea of glass where those who have gotten the victory over the beast and his image will stand, waving palm branches to the glory of the Most High God, saying, Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. O my brother and my sister, make up your mind to be there. It's not about a stimulus check. It's about salvation by the blood of the Lamb. It's not about a temporary fix, but it's about salvation that cannot be reversed by the blood of the Lamb. Father, speak to your people and get us ready, we ask, in the worthy and holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Next week, my brothers and sisters, tune in again for the message entitled The Final Coalition. The Final Coalition. God bless you until we see you then.